Hey everyone, welcome to the Hash Rate Podcast. I'm the Bitcoin Broski here today with our special guest. The gentleman's been on the show before. Most of you probably know him on Twitter at OGBTC, Marshall Long. Marshall, welcome back. Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me again. Always a pleasure. The pleasure is mine. I, you know, for anyone who wants Marshall's backstory, go and listen to the previous episode that we did. We talk all about how he got into crypto and into Bitcoin mining. Um, he was definitely one of the first to mine at scale. So we're not going to do that today. We're going to reserve this talk time for uh, it's just uh, Marshall's thoughts on what's going on in the industry right now. So uh, Marshall, what are you working on right now? Um, so right now, um, we just finished a build out in Canada and we are fast approaching our finish of our phase one build out in the States. Um, we're actually going to start coming online next Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> that's probably consumed most of my time, I would say. Um, beyond that, uh, just trying to, uh, you know, day trade this ICO that's known as traditional equity markets. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good old j Powell yesterday, making life interesting oh, for yeah. everyone. Oh, man. What, what do you make of this situation right now? I mean, very broad question. But what are your Anybody thoughts? that says inflation is good for you is so far out of touch with reality doesn't like, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a surprise, but I mean, when you triple your balance sheet effectively overnight and like the government timeline of things, I mean, you're going to have to say something, I guess. Uh, I can say that most people in this space uh, who are in this space for like the fundamentals, um, but I probably saw this coming. Um, and it's unfortunate due to the timing. I, you know, <clears throat> I was driving around last week and, and the food bank line was really long. It was scary, you know, because tons of people still out of work, but stocks are literally an ICO at this point. Like the, they're just pumping crazy with zero fundamentals behind them. Everybody's balance sheets wrecked, uh, you know, it's just absolute insanity at this point. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin was spawned during a time of insanity, and I think this one's going to be even bigger. So we'll see if Bitcoin shines. You know, this unlimited quantitative easing that we're experiencing, I mean, it's unprecedented, right? There's been inflation, and I guess there there are you know precedents with regards to inflation in other countries, but never from a country as powerful as the United States is now, where do you think this lands us as a nation in the next 10 years? You know, it's interesting too, because I'm, um, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm like a fan of China or whatever. I don't really care personally, but um, it's, it's cool from like a geopolitics standpoint to see uh, China's reaction to a lot of this. Um, you know, you've got, <clears throat> when you see uh, the reserve currencies start to um, inflate more than they probably should, the IMF's talking more about Bitcoin, more about gold. Uh, you know, uh, the Winklevoss have an interesting take on gold and the fact that they think that um, asteroid mining is going to nah. be a big thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how like, you know, <laughs> rational that kind of thought is, but it's fun to think about. Um, it makes a great case for Bitcoin. Uh, I, I think you're starting to see the, the large cracks forming. I mean, there's already so much social unrest and there's been social unrest in the States for a while, but mm -hmm. now it's very prolonged kind of what you're seeing in Hong Kong. Uh, and, China has been making a lot of moves. They started to do, you know, all these deals with like Pakistan and, and people who have inherent trust in the States and really positioning the Yuan to be very strong in a weak U S time. Um, hopefully it doesn't turn into all out war, but uh, I guess we'll see. It's, it's, I would say it's about time that the U S starts getting its head cracked a little bit. I mean, for too long, it's been kind of like the, the, evil empire with the facade of like, Oh, we're the white knights. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I see that living in the States. So I kind of have a front row seat to the madness. 
Yeah, it's the the SJW is getting wrecked by the SJWs right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's I I would agree with you that China's making some big moves, and they've been doing this for. I mean, they've been playing chess for a long time, right? Oh yeah. Um, and their one road initiative, which a lot of people mm, yeah are calling a failure, mm. uh, they invested in a lot of countries. Um, it, I I think with the move of you know later getting that reserve currency switched. Um, and helping to become their their big ally as opposed to uh, those countries who are relying on the United States for security and uh, to be that white knight, right? I mean, the reason that America is able to step in and save the day a lot of the times is because these countries' governments just defer to the U.S. Okay. So if that deferral starts going to China instead of to the U.S., then I mean, that changes, that changes the scope of things. Um, I mean, for Bitcoin mining, right, you see... Russia, Venezuela, Iran, mm-hmm. all stepping into, you know, now publicly endorse mining um, and cryptocurrency in general as a way to circumvent sanctions. Right. So, I don't know, have you, have you seen uh, a little bit of what's going on in Belarus right now? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not familiar. So, I'm like three hours from there, yeah. right? Uh, there's, they're in the process of like a, a peaceful revolt where they've mm. had... Uh, a dictator that's been in place for, I mean, basically since the Cold War. Right. Right. And um, he lost the election. Well, oh, really? He won the election, but it was supposed to be, or it's claimed that he, he falsified the, mm. the results. So now everyone wants to overthrow him. And uh, it's a, as a, as a Bitcoin mining company, Hashrate is looking at this like, okay, there's about to be a lot of new opportunity in Europe because they have a tremendous amount of nuclear power Mm -hmm. Um, in a transitionary phase like this country may go through. It could open up that power to, I mean, companies can do with it what they will because, I mean, they just built a new nuclear power plant there not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about tons and tons and tons of very cheap power. They can't turn off. So it's got to That's right. They can't turn it off Um, and, and they're not able to kind of like use it in other places because not a lot of people live there i noticed that when i um i went around poland for uh some esports stuff and i just saw tons of nuclear power plants and i was like nobody lives here though like what what's going on so that that similar situation you know a lot of europe is powered on nuclear uh we actually talked to somebody yesterday that was selling nuclear power in france and they quoted let's see it was like 1.7 cents oh i'd like that you, guy's you, contact info you know, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, that's not all in, but whatever. Yeah, it's yeah, still, of course. It's a nice place to start. Yeah. So, you know, as I mean, you're, you're in the thick of it, man. You're, you're building the facility in Canada. You've got another facility in the U S and I mean, others that you've worked with around the globe. What are some of the trends that you're seeing right now when it comes to, to the build out? So I think the phase of uh, people getting wrecked from 2017 overbuilding is coming to an end. Um, the hardware, the, like, the really crappy hardware, secondary market sales are slowing down. What's interesting now, though, is uh, the hardware is starting to dry up again uh, as the price starts to run. So what you're probably going to see is people who put orders down uh, for machines be able to sell those for a premium. I know we've got orders that are coming in and now our manufacturers sold out until like March or April of next year. Mm. Um, I mean, Bitmain with the S17 pluses, don't even get me started on that. We, uh, <laughs> we had a fair bit of uh, issues there. Um, what was your guys' failure rate on those? I, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. It's, it's like 20 or 30% for some people I'd heard. It's more. Jesus. Yeah. Let's just say uh Gion had a few late night phone calls from me. <laughs> so um, are you guys working now mostly with what's minor then? I can tell you, man, that <clears throat> it's it's not prudent to just like only go with one manufacturer sure. just because it's so niche. Um I mean we have some S nineteens um and they're fine. So, you know, hopefully the S seventeen run was just a blip and it probably was. But uh, I can tell you that we have started walking down the road with What's Miner, and it's been really a breath of fresh air. Their business uh, ethos is very different from Bitmain. They're more of um, they have a global look outlook as opposed to like a China first outlook, which is fine. You know, the S19s you weren't able to get them unless you had a Chinese company 
first and then they mm -hmm. open sales to the states. Whereas what's minor has, um, my first question to them was like, Hey, what's the process if I have to RMA these 20,000 machines, right? And their response was, well, we can get a guy out there to, to kind of like teach you guys how to prepare the stuff or like, you know, you pay for his time and th th their flexibility yeah. for a North American based operation is very great. And their hardware is awesome. Um, yeah. I think even last year they surpassed Bitmain as far as number of units sold. And I think this year for sure they will, um, you know, they're, uh, it's a great team and they're very, the communication is very on point. I've had nothing but, but great experience with this, with them so far. Let's see how this next batch of miners arrives go. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're really good at communication for sure. What do you make of the whole Bitmain situation right now? Do you think we're close to a resolution there or is this going to drag on for months? I can tell you that uh, they are, I think, very far from a resolution. Uh, Oof. And now with the issues that they've had with S-17s, I've had a lot of talks with my colleagues that are even bigger than me, and they're all in on the S-19 still. And I'm like, man, really? I mean, we're, we're running diversified, but they're like still like, yeah, the S-17s were just a, a small blip, and they're going deep on S-19s. I'm like, all right. So, I mean, the, the other issue is uh, – there's not going to be any improvements for at least two or three years, in my opinion, as far as, you mm. know, efficiency. And so I, I think it would be prudent for people to diversify their gear. And now with the coming shortage, I don't know if a lot of people know about that coming shortage, but there is a shortage looming. And if the price starts to run, I think you'll see a giant secondary market like we did in 2017 again. So um, the game theory portion of mining that a lot of people don't know or think about or plan for is coming. And then what's going to happen after that for the people who don't plan, you're going to have a really crappy machines as the new ones come out and people bought too late. So I think you'll see this cycle uh, start up probably towards the end of this year. Mm. Yep. I mean, it's, it's the same with, with stocks, with shit coins, with Bitcoin, with hardware right? The, the cycle is there because the price of these machines are basically pegged to the price of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Um, you'll see it's the same with GPUs and with ASICs. Mm -hmm. The prices run just as the, the coins price runs and you get people to buy the top and they get stuck with machines that they're never going to be able to ROI because once the price turns down, so do the prices of their machines. So they can't get out of the machines that they're in at a much higher price. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. So, I mean, with no improvements coming from Bitmain in the next two to three years, I mean, that leaves space wide open for others. Um, there was the announcement a couple of days ago about the strong U SHA-256 ASIC. Have you given that a look yet? Uh, I've seen it. I've not given it a look. Everybody that <clears throat> says, hey, I've got a new ASIC or, I mean, I've probably had three calls just this month <clears throat> or either, hey, I've got a new machine or, hey, we found a way to mine that like one watt per T or whatever. I've had three of those kind of calls and that happens monthly and, and the reality is most people coming from like the traditional chip design world are are truthfully more capable than like a just a bitcoin designer bitcoin chip mm -hmm. designer because they're not that difficult but everybody thinks they've discovered fire and nobody in my opinion has um that's the first thing i'm seeing the second thing is uh the new miners that come out it's not just about how good your miner is as far as efficiency or how fast there's a lot of other details that most people who are new to the game don't understand density you know how how big is your machine physically mm -hmm. uh how much how big is the power supply do i have to have special breakers to run it you know i've had people like hey we got a 5,000 watt power supply i'm like okay well then my 30 amp breakers are going to have to be changed so there's more op uh more capex that needs to be invested mm -hmm. um temperatures um longevity as far as how good they'll run what kind of environments do they need right some machines that are really nice they have to run in a very clean environment and for a large scale operation you know with 10 20 30,000 miners that's not really a reality so there's a lot of other considerations that go into it that you just can't know by having a unit like a sample unit just running right on a test bench sure. and you don't know that until you you know 
order up a thousand and your RMA rates 10, 20, 30%. And even qualified, <laughs> you know, makers have these yeah. issues. So there's a lot to be seen for, uh, especially strong you. I'm, I'm, anybody that says, Hey, I got a new miner. My first thing is always, Hey, send me a sample. I'll check it out. Definitely happy to get feedback. I've done that at least a dozen times to at least six or seven new manufacturers and some of them work out. And then you have issues with meeting demand. If you're too successful mm -hmm. for your own supply chain, then you're useless. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. God, what a balance. <sighs> As we're facing this current bottleneck and looking down the barrel of a shortage even more, I mean, the TSMC plant that's set to open in the southwestern United States here in the next six months, um, I mean, do you, do you see a North American manufacturer coming on anytime soon? I mean, is, is it realistic? So that's a conversation I've had a lot actually over the past two weeks. Uh, I would say if it's TSMC, yes. The problem with it not being TSMC, man, running a foundry is insane. It's an, an, a mind-boggling amount of engineering that goes into that. And even more that goes into like the daily operations. Like they're in the, in the clean rooms, they're an order of magnitude cleaner than like a surgical room. Like it's really insanity level engineering. And that's why there's only a few foundries because it's just that, I mean, even Intel, a company the size of Intel, couldn't get past 10 nanometer for several years. So that it's not just, mm -hmm. you gotta be the top, top, top of what you're doing. So the reality of something that's not TSMC coming online, I would put money on being zero. Um, another question is uh, recently, you know, Trump said that TSMC had to stop making chips for Huawei. Uh, Philip Salter, actually this morning on Twitter, the COO or something of Genesis Mining, good mm -hmm. guy, super yep. smart dude. He brought up a great point. He said, hey, look, if they say TSMC can't make chips for any Chinese company, what's going to happen to mining? And that brings up all kinds of, in my opinion, good things like decentralization and mining uh, hardware longevity and what could be a bad situation would turn into, I think, good for the network. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, if TSMC can get it together, that's great. But there's a lot of logistics that, that go into that, right? So um, I would say it would be very awesome if they did. And they're the only people who can do it. God, if that happened, it would make life pretty awesome for everyone that's <laughs> yeah. got hardware up and running already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. It's that is basically sure. just give you five years without any increased competition because no one would be putting any uh, machines online. It would be glorious. And then it's just a race <laughs> to the bottom for power. So then we'll see, you know, who's got the stomach as the price starts to run. Uh, so um, right now with, with your, your facilities, are you mostly immersion or is it? So our, our place cold? in Canada uh, is not immersion. Our place in the States is it's uh. We, we think it's a pretty good design. We've been working on it for, actually I started working on it in 2013. Um, after a conference in Brazil, a guy randomly approached me and was like, hey, I've got this idea to do this immersion stuff like with this like car engine and this radiator I ripped out of an old Volkswagen. I was like, oh, that's sick. Problem with immersion is there's a whole host of other things like the pipe design. Oh my God. That's like a whole nother can of worms that like I'm most people don't understand, you know, fluid dynamics, including me. Like there's a whole host of other issues that can go wrong. You know, um, those guys had to really refine the design for like three years to get it real sexy where they understood everything, you know, variable frequency drives and all this stuff. That's just like real engineering problems. Um, for a mm -hmm. large scale op, I think that's the biggest challenge. Now to the people who jump right on CapEx, right? Like immersion and mm. the unreasonably high CapEx or the crazy CapEx, it's usually that's the, the thought. So why is that incorrect or why do you feel that that's incorrect? And if that's not incorrect, why, why go with immersion instead of right. air cooled? So it's a give and take. The CapEx, uh, if you have a refined design, let me caveat this whole thing, a refined design from both a cost standpoint and from operational uh, standpoint, 
if you have a refined design, your CapEx would only be maybe 10, maybe 15% higher from a build out standpoint. However, mm -hmm. it does many things. It allows you to overclock harder if you choose to. It allows you to have a bigger, uh, your better density. So if, if uh, space is a consideration. Um, the other thing is, in my experience, the reason I really like immersion beyond all the benefits that you can get from it is the maintenance and opex is so much cheaper and it reminds me going from like gpu mining bitcoin to asics i was just like i'm never touching a gpu ever again <laughs> getting a computer to run with like six or eight or 12 graphics cards is such a pain in the butt and i have no idea how you guys at hash rate os are able to not just constantly be like we're done we're done we're done it's just such a maintenance nightmare and, and hats off to you guys for doing such a great job with your management software that it makes it much easier. Thanks, but, you know, typically for like a nice big air cooled setup, you're going to have one or two people per megawatt of power, mm -hmm. you know, checking machines and doing the day to day stuff. But right. for our new build out, we're running a guy for every eight or 10 megawatts. Wow. And so we're able to save on OPEX because the people that work for us, we, you know, they have benefits and they're well incentivized. They got stock options and all this stuff. So, I mean, that cost adds up and onboarding new people. There's always the risk of like somebody you don't know. Well, you know, trying to get mm -hmm. one over on you, that kind of stuff. That's always a concern. So yep. it allows you to also take risk off the table in that way. So, there are upfront CapEx costs for long-term OPEX savings. That's the way I look at it. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, moving a little bit down a different path, it seems that the American way of doing business has really crept into, uh, not crept, it's like kicked in the door and America is here when it comes to Bitcoin mining. We've got lawsuits being filed, <laughs> patent infringement cases, like... Cypherpunk no more. We are coming in with our attorneys and we're wrecking shop. Um, what's, what's your take on this? Like, I, I don't, we don't need to get into the specifics of the Lantium yeah. layer one like mm -hmm. situation, but just high level overview. How do you feel about this evolution in the Bitcoin mining business? So I can tell you it's uh, similar and both dissimilar from 20, like 12 and 13 when ASICs first started coming out. Bitcoin mining in the States was pretty big. Um, you know, one of the first big ops was run by uh, Dave Carlson over at Mega Big Power. Um, I don't think they do anything anymore, but um, that was when mining in the States was pretty big compared to the rest of the world. But it was still super like cypherpunky, like just mm -hmm. a bunch of nerds doing stuff, making tons of money. That's, that's really what it was. Um, now... And then it went to China, of course, and now it's starting to come back. What I'm seeing is quite interesting. A lot of my um, Chinese buddies have seen great deals in the States, better than what they're able to get in uh, China. But they always say, well, nowadays they'll say, hey, we can't take the risk of doing business there because we don't know what your government's going to do which is a really interesting point because that used to be the conversation like, hey, we don't know what the Chinese government's going to do, right. right? So the tables from an operational standpoint have changed as far as nationalities go because um, you're starting to see a lot of like international students, you know, all the, um, the um, yep. DACA yeah. or whatever, they, the, the visa, visa, yeah, all the visa here. stuff yeah. is all crazy and they don't want to lose their businesses, especially with the Huawei stuff going on and, and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So that was... Uh, something very interesting uh, that I've seen. Now you're starting to see big, what's interesting I think is you're starting to see big companies that will then go public and then go bankrupt because they don't know what they're doing. Um, that's happened like three or four times this mm -hmm. year alone and even last year too. So the people who think they know how to run a data center, and this has been the perpetual story of mining, the big boys think they're big boys in mining. They get smoked, their stock goes down and then they leave. I mean, that's always been a thing, but now you're starting to see people bring more legitimacy as far as, uh, without mentioning names, people blatantly lying to investors and fraud, like literally straight up fraud being caught and taken to court, which didn't used to be the case. So I think it's, it's good in the fact that it makes people more honest, 
uh, bad in the fact that it's lost the kind of uh, kind of cypherpunky homeboy vibe, you know. Um, so I think it's a give and take. I think it brings legitimacy. You're now seeing companies like put their cash reserves in Bitcoin, which I think is freaking huge and awesome. Yeah. That would have never yeah. happened if people couldn't sue each other. Well, and I mean, like, look, that, that wasn't like, oh, you know, we've got a uh, million dollars. It, yeah. it was a quarter billion dollars in cash reserves, right? Just a little, just a little bit. It's a little it's bit. so insane. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, we made it, boy. We're out yeah. here. Woo! I was <laughs> super hyped just because, you know, coming from the early days, you tell somebody you're into Bitcoin, oh, that's drugs, right? To now, like, large companies saying that a quarter of our cash holdings is in Bitcoin. That's so insane. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time, definitely. And I think you're right, man. I mean, it, this kind of stuff can't be avoided. There's, there's going to be some overlap in the way that people are doing business. Uh, inevitably things, I mean, courts are there for a reason, right? Like that's why they're there to settle these disputes as they're, you know, as they're put forward. Um, I hope that the, the Lantium and the layer one, one, we we get to see play out. I hope it's not settled behind closed doors and it's, it's all <laughs> secret. Um, it, it's, it's a curious thing. I, there's a lot of people that are now rushing to file defensive patents because they feel that Lantium is patent trolling. It's creating a, a bit of a, a challenging situation for, uh, sometimes undercapitalized businesses that now think that they're on the cusp of releasing something groundbreaking, but they've got to devote a, a significant part of their, uh, their remaining capital to, you know, getting lawyers and getting these patents in place, which is not a cheap process depending on yeah, you know, what you're trying to protect. Side, right. I mean, it's kind of, <clears throat> in my opinion, Bitcoin is kind of like by the people for the people type of mentality still. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons I'm still in it. Um, and it's crappy to see, young scrappy startups have to go through that, but that's not synonymous to Bitcoin, right? I mean, that's synonymous with any kind of tech company yes. and it's just kind of crappy because the law used to be for IP that it was first to invent, not first to patent in the States. I think they changed that in like 2014 or 15, which sucks because you used to be able to get, if you had proof that you invented it first, you could go to the mm -hmm. courts and get the patent overturned. Now that's yeah. not the case. So USPTO has always been kind of a crapper and mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's just kind of the way it goes. Well, and let's be real here. All we're doing is hurting North American mining. Like this kind of patent stuff, uh, China doesn't care. Like patent all you <laughs> like, Very spend, true. Spend all your money on patents, focus on fighting each other. And I mean, hey, they're just going to continue to to own, <laughs> own Bitcoin oh, yeah. tax, you know? Um, but I mean, look, it's... It is what it is. It's gonna. It, it's. It was bound to occur. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, uh, being deployed in infrastructure. Mm. Um, it's. It's got to get protected, right? There are people that are going to spend the extra money to make sure that what they're building is protected. So, kudos to them. Um, okay, dude. So, Bitcoin mining aside, there is. You mentioned ICOs earlier, and we've got a little bit of a hype cycle going on right now around DeFi. A little, a little bit, a little bit of a hype cycle. Just a little one. Uh, are you mining yams? I tell you, look, man, <clears throat> I'm a Texas boy, so you already know I'm in the ground digging them up. <laughs> when I first saw this, like, honestly, I think it's like a DeFi bubble, maybe. Um, and I've, I've tried to educate myself a lot on it just because I've had my head in the Bitcoin world for so long. I mean, I'm, my career has been very bad at like keeping up with stuff. Like when the, term ERC 20 came out like it took me like six months to get like a ERC compatible address and so I've always been kind of behind the curve on these things but when I heard about all the yam stuff and a big one in the Chinese community is one called eFi right now yeah um you're in I started, yeah I started digging into a lot of this stuff here's the problem that I see with DeFi in general it doesn't matter if it's on ethereum or bitcoin eventually or whatever the problem with programmable type things is you're only as good as the person who made the contract. And that's what I said about when Ethereum, you know, fixed, fixed the DAO hack. It's not really a smart contract if the developer's stupid. That's just kind of how it is. And um, I think it was on your podcast. Uh, maybe last week, um, somebody said something to the effect of these contracts are great until they get so big that they become then a target or something like that where you know you spent so much time doing the development and you have you know 
a million or two million into the contract. And then after like overnight, it explodes to like a hundred million. And you're like, literally overnight, you're a target. And it's really hard to do contract changes after this kind of ship is sailed. So from like a DeFi standpoint, it's really tough because you become your own target because of your success. So I don't think there's a way to fix that. And that's always been the problem, right? There's bugs in every kind of code. And when you have code that's also money, it's super, super hard to fix that. So I think DeFi is awesome from a standpoint of programmable money and yield farming and all that. Um, I don't think there's any problem with that, but it's just a hard problem to crack. I mean, Ethereum is still having bugs, man, and it's been forever. And they have some of the most talented developers I've ever met in my life. Yeah. How do you fix that? I don't know. I mean, are we, are we, are we going to see ETH 2.0 in the 20s? Like, is it? Oh, <laughs> I've been hearing about <laughs> proof of stake, proof of stake. The first time I really heard it, it was, uh, I was at the MIT, maybe the first or second MIT Bitcoin conference. And Talik was just sitting there and I was like, Hey man, uh, what do you think about this? You really think you could pull it off? And this was like 2014 or 2015, 16. I don't know. My years are all run together at this point. And, and he was walking me through like, uh, you know, the, uh, Nova coin, I think was like the first proof of stake coin or something like that. Okay. And how the difference is there. And, and I was like, Oh, that sounds great. But I mean, we're halfway through 2020 and they still can't get it right. And that, look, I know it is a very, very non-trivial change. Sure. Any kind of consensus change is incredibly difficult. Um, but this like whole 2.0 thing, I'm not going to be the person that's like, oh, they're just bad devs. It's just like a really freaking hard problem to solve. That's just the reality. Yeah. And I mean, look, when, what I mean, if you build something to go back and fix it is, I mean, oftentimes harder than to just start yeah. from scratch and build it again. And I think that we're seeing right now other smart contract platform, platforms that have fixed it, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, and we're seeing people that are choosing to build on things other than Ethereum, yeah, uh, like you know Sam with FTX choosing to you know build his DEX on Solana instead, mm-hmm. uh, and, ju- and just because of scalability, I'm sure there are other issues, but scalability is a big part of it, right? Like CryptoKitties was what 2017, mm-hmm. and there were all of those problems, and here we are 2020, and you still have people paying a thousand fourteen hundred dollars on transaction fees because the network is so incredibly congested. And it can't handle the volume. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, the it parallels sucks. between the growth of Bitcoin and the growth of Ethereum are really, really similar, in my opinion. And, you know, I, for better or worse, started a project called Bitcoin Classic, which kind of morphed into Bitcoin Cash. So I really understood the like growing pains of a blockchain and even more so because it's an open source community driven thing. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to get people to agree. Yeah, like over a hundred people to agree is damn near impossible at this mm. point. And that's always been the case, not just for software. And, you know, I'm sure when they do ETH 2.0, there'll be another sect of people that fork off to do, you know, Ethereum classic 2.0 or whatever they're going to call it. Uh, I don't know, but that's the beauty of open source software. And that's the beauty of what we do, right? If you don't like it, take your toys and go home and do your own thing. Um, and that's really, I think, the power of the internet. So um, it's going to be really rough. And for people that have infrastructure invested, I, it, it also reminds me all the, the flight of dApps to different chains. When EOS first launched, I was mm-hmm. a block producer for a year. And the RAM costs were whatever, and people developed solutions to fix that and all this. But you still saw dApps flying to other chains like WaxChain and Telos and these other very similar kind of fee list type scenarios. Yeah. Um, and now you're seeing people move to like Solana and uh, Cosmos and, you know, all, all these other things. So it's just like governance is, I think, never going to be solved from like a programmatic standpoint. And anytime you have to make a consensus change that requires governance to be in place, it's just hard, man. And I don't know that there's a way to fix it. I'm of the belief that governance doesn't work early in a, a business. Like mm. uh, a consensus, like ruling by committee um, is great if you have an established product, established profit, 
um, and it can be passed off. But I think that at the outset of a business, there really has to be a, like one driving vision, one, one leading voice um, that can guide the others. And it's not to say that it's, you know, a dictator and the followers, um, but there needs to be, you know, a support around the belief of, you know, the person who founded it. I think that Ethereum has what, like 35 co-founders, mm-hmm. um, something like that. So it started off in this model and it's just tough. It's tough to get things off the ground in that way. And they did, I think a, a great job to this point and um, God bless them for bringing some profitability <laughs> back to ETH mining, you know, no joke, no joke. Those fees so, really helped out. That's for sure. Let's see. Yeah, well, and you know, Bitcoin seeing it too, like mm-hmm. all seasons are good for Bitcoin mining. I think that like the, the maxis sometimes forget that, but all of these retail traders that are transferring between sites and getting in and out of positions more often than they should be. And like that all contributes to uh, transactions or the fees on the, the block reward. So man, I, I'm, I'm excited to see the cycle continue. I hope we're, uh, we're going to see another continued alt run followed by some more Bitcoin action. This just mm-hmm. goes on and on indefinitely. I knew it was starting to pick up because literally yesterday was the first time in I don't know, maybe a year or two. I looked up a chart. Bitcoin dominance chart. Um, Cause this is, what it was at like 65% or something. It's still pretty high. Okay. But okay. Uh, when I started seeing all this stuff on Twitter about yams and EFI and up, and when you see words like Bitcoin killer starting to pop up on CT, that's how, you know, like cycle starting, it's starting. So yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but what Max Kaiser always says is shit coins were made to steal your Bitcoin. So um I'm of the belief that that Bitcoin is still probably uh, going to remain the king as far as yes. market cap and that kind of stuff, just because the network's so secure and it's been around and institutions and all this blah blah blah. But uh, Bitcoin kind of sucks on a lot of other things. Like I do want programmable money, and I do want to be able to see all kinds of cool stuff come out of altcoins. So I, I do think there's still use for them, but um, it's just tough, man. It's really hard yeah. because the more deep you go into it, the more vulnerabilities you make. So, yeah, I mean, I'm hats off to Jack Mallers uh, with Zap and and Strike for all the work that he's doing. I think oh, that yeah. you know that's some some cool stuff that he's building on Bitcoin, and the innovation just has to has to pick up. I mean, it's you know, when you have so many talented devs scattered across a ton of shit coins that are looking to build, I mean, it's just, if you were able to consolidate all of that onto Bitcoin and get them all building on, on Bitcoin, it would be, it would, you know, the innovation would be uh, something to behold. And I'm sure we'll see something like that soon. Like uh, there's, there's going to be a breakthrough. I there's hope. so many people that are working. I don't on know. It. I had there's, big hopes for Rootstock. Um, you know, Sergio mm-hmm. is probably one of the most talented devs in the space. Um, but for one reason or another, it's just not heavily adopted. I know Rootstock has had a lot of great innovation, but uh, and I'm not super boned up on it. I just know that it's a cool protocol running on Bitcoin and that can en- enable a lot of stuff. But uh, I think people are just so obsessed with Ethereum that it's hard to kind of get more people attracted to. And also the development culture is way different. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever been to like um, – uh, an ETHCon, like a developer Ethereum convention. I haven't. It's so different than a Bitcoin developer conference. You know, like scaling Bitcoin in Montreal and, and Hong Kong were like very, like very, very hardcore as far as like, we're here to talk about development. And and then I go to this Ethereum developer conference in Toronto, I think it was. And Vitalik and the core devs are just like dancing on stage. And I'm like, yeah. this is that the culture is just so night and day and it's yeah. great. So I, you know that, and that culture attracts a lot of people. I mean, me included, I, Hey, I'm the first guy to say, Hey, let's get weird. You know? So I think the development culture is also very different. So. Absolutely. Well, okay. You know, Marshall, as we, uh, as we wrap things up here, man, is there anything else that you'd like to share with people? Anything that's on your mind that we haven't talked about things that you're noticing that maybe you want to point out? I would say that it's super easy to forget why everybody is here. Bitcoin is, and just crypto in general is still exciting. Think, look at all the crap happening around the world. 
you should still be excited that you at least understand how to have your own financial sovereignty, how to circumvent any kind of shenanigans that the government could throw at you. At the end of the day, if you are empowered in that sense, you should feel good about your standing in the world. doesn't matter if you have a ton of Bitcoin or not, but you have the tools to protect yourself and your loved ones. And that's what's important. Mic drop. Marshall, thank you for coming on the show, man. Hey, thanks so much, Whit. Hey, it was a pleasure. And to all of the viewers and listeners out there, thank you guys for tuning into the Hashrate Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on whichever platform you're listening. Leave us a rating and review. And until next time, we'll talk to you guys all again very soon. Thanks for watching this episode of Hashrate Podcast, a Hashrate TV production. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing for more great content like this every day of the week. In addition, feel free to leave a comment below and let us know who you'd like to see on the next episode of Hashrate Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you head over to Hashrate.com, you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Difficulty Adjustment. Every Wednesday morning, we provide you with the latest news and information on Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and mining. Plus, each week, one newsletter subscriber will be selected at random to receive a free Ledger Nano S cryptocurrency wallet. So go ahead and sign up today. Who knows, you may be the next lucky winner. Want more from Hashrate? Follow Hashrate TV on Twitter. It's the easiest way to keep track of our newest content all in one place. That's at hashr 8 underscore TV. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you very soon. Please remember that all content appearing on this or any other Hashrate channel is strictly for informational and entertainment purposes only. You should not construe any such information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Consult a licensed financial advisor before investing yours or anyone else's money.